Welcome, everyone, to today's TCS Plus talk. Uh, we're very lucky to have Ronit Rubenfeld talking to us today. Um, today's uh, operator is Thomas Vidic. Behind the scenes, we also have Clem Mokanan, Anindya Day, uh, Oded Regev, and Thomas Holenstein. So we'll start by uh, Thomas taking, it around, taking us around the table and introducing everyone. All right, so welcome, everyone. Um, we have a few groups uh, joining us here. So first group is uh, um, Amit Levy from University of uh, Waterloo. Uh, hi, guys. You can wave at the camera. Yep, hello. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, Clément Cannon uh, from uh, Columbia University. Hey, guys. Uh, then we have K. Gopalakrishnan from East Carolina, East Carolina University, I'm sorry. Then there's uh, Piyush Srivastava joining us uh, from Caltech. Ooh. Then we have uh, Shravas Rao in the group from NYU. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Yi Jun Chang uh, joining us from University of Michigan. And we're still expecting groups from EPFL and UCSD, but I think we should, um, hopefully, they'll join us soon and we can uh, go ahead. So uh, back to you, um, G. Great. Thanks. Uh, um, so just a reminder that you're going to be muted by default. And if you want to ask a question or anything, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, we've also got a great uh, number of, uh, we've got a, some great talks coming up, actually. Two weeks from today, we're going to have Olaf Benson speaking. Uh, two weeks after that, we're going to have uh, uh, Tali Kaufman, I believe. And then two weeks after that, we have uh, Ron Raz. So stay tuned for more info on all these speakers. But as for today, we're very lucky to have Ronit Rubenfeld, professor at MIT in Tel Aviv, speaking to us. Um, her research focuses on randomized algorithms, sublinear algorithms, property testing, and learning theory. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from Michigan and her PhD from Berkeley. She spent some time at Princeton and Hebrew University as a postdoc uh, before joining a faculty position at Cornell, where she spent a number of years. Um, and she also spent some time as a researcher at NEC Research Lab before joining uh, MIT and then Tel Aviv. She's the recipient of a number of awards, um, including being named a fellow of the ACM, a Sloan Fellow, um, an NSF Career Award, and I learned today, Cornell ACSU Faculty of the Year back at Cornell. So without further ado, uh, Ronit Rubenfeld. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about local computation algorithms. Uh, and I'm going to give a survey, but there's been a lot going on in this area. Uh, so it's, it's not exhaustive. So if I left out something really interesting to you, it doesn't, I didn't talk about everything. Okay? So it's not exhaustive, but it might actually be exhausting to listen to. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. Okay. So here's the context. The context here's like the required slide. So okay, we're talking about big data. There's huge inputs. Um, you know, I always have this slide. But what's different about today is the data is so big. The inputs are really large that you don't have time to see it all. But in addition, we're trying to you're trying to compute some sort of computational problem where also the output is large. OK, so it's not just that there's a large input and you're trying to figure out something about it, like some parameter, but you actually want to compute a real live output that's based on this input, and the output itself is large. OK, so what do you do? Well, hopefully, you don't actually need to see all the output. Um, so when you don't need to see all the output, the question is, do you still need to look at all the input, make the whole computation, and then look at the part of the output that that you're interested in? Or is it possible just to look at part of the input and figure out the part of the output that you need? OK, so that's that's sort of the question we want to ask here. Um, and of course, in general, you know, in general, you do need to see all the input. But w maybe there's a lot of interesting cases where you don't actually need to see that much of the input. And you don't need to do that much computation in order to figure out the output that you want. So this may actually sound quite familiar to you because the, um, such models have been around for a long time. OK, so let me give some examples that are hopefully familiar to you. Um, locally, list, locally decodable codes and locally list decodable codes. The input is the encoding of a large message, a very large message. Um, and the output of the decoding algorithm is the original large message. So now the question is, do you, maybe you don't want to actually decode the whole thing. Maybe all you care about is what's the ith bit of the original message. So 
it's, so the question is then, is it possible to figure out the value of the ith bit by looking at just a small number of locations in the input? And in general, um, that may not be true, but you can, you can design really good codes which have um, rate that's almost as good as any other code and for which very few queries are needed to compute the answers of the type, what is the ith bit? Okay, so such, lo such great codes exist. It's been a lot of work. I've only given two citations, but there's tons of citations. Um, so, okay. A similar idea can be used in decompression. So the, here the input would be the compression of a large data. And the output of the decompression algorithm would be hopefully the original large data. And maybe you don't want to figure out the whole um, original large data. You just want to know the ith bit. Okay, so let's take an example. Maybe you have this huge gene bank and you've compressed it, say, something like Lempel's if, and you now want to figure out, like, what's the 47th piece of my gene, okay? So you don't want to decompress everybody's genes, just mine, and just one piece of mine, okay? That's all you want to do. And it, you don't want to, so you don't want to run the whole decompression algorithm, and it turns out that you can design certain compression schemes that compress well. What do we mean by that? We mean compared to uh, famous compression schemes, okay? so. For example, uh, no more than 1 plus epsilon times the compression of Lempel's if or something like that. And then they also have the property that you only need a few queries to the input in order to answer the question. Okay, so that's um, another example. Other examples include there's been a lot of work on local algorithms for graph partitioning and page rank uh, to find a good cut near a node without looking at the whole graph, to estimate the page rank of a node without looking at the whole World Wide Web graph, um, spam detection, community detection. So there's, I, I gave as many um, citations as I could find here on this slide. You can look at it later. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, but there's a lot of work that's done here. Okay, and one other vein of work that I'd like to mention is online property reconstruction. Here, you're given some kind of large input that's supposed to have some useful property, but maybe it's been slightly corrupted. So you'd like to kind of give you'd like to give access to a corrected input, um, which is both close to the original input, um, but sort of undoes the corruption in the sense that it now has the useful property. Let me give an example. Uh, so maybe you have like a list of numbers and they're supposed to be in sorted order. Okay, so it's supposed to be a monotone increasing set of numbers. Um, but as you see, there's some corruptions here. So the fourth and the sixth numbers are not, um, are, are smaller than their pre predecessors. Okay, so what you'd like to do is sort of correct this and any way to correct this is fine, um, but you'd like to give a way to answer these types of questions, you'd like to give query access to this new list with the green values instead of the old red values um, in such a way that the, the, the user, you don't have to look at the whole list in, in order to do the correction. I mean, clearly you can do the correction by looking at the whole list, figuring out what you need to do to fix the monotonicity, but can you do it in such a way that you don't have to look at everything? You can just look at, um, you can just look at a few values. And let me warn you that it's not enough just to look at the predecessor or maybe like a small set of predecessors and successors. You actually do need to look around in the list um, at various locations that are kind of further apart. Uh, so there's some really non-trivial ways of doing this um, for monotonicity, for Lipschitz functions, uh, for convexity, for um, if you're given a graph that's supposed to be an expander but it's missing a few edges and therefore isn't an expander, you can fix it. You can fix graphs and make them connected, strongly connected, k-connected, small diameter. Uh, so these are, you get to fix it by adding edges or deleting edges, whatever it is that you need to do. Okay, so there's lots of types of problems where the input's large, the output's large, but you only compute a small part of the output um, by querying few locations of the input. So what we'd like to do is come up with a good sort of, let me call it unifying model. Uh, so we've got this large input, x, that's written down, the output y, it's kind of in your head. It's not written anywhere. And we're going to call it a local computation algorithm. This is like a little query answering machine that you get to ask it questions about the output. So you might ask this local computation algorithm, what is the i one bit of the output y? And it needs to answer uh, y, 
I1. And then I'll ask it, okay, now I want to know the I second bit of YI, and it'll give me the answer, okay? And in the meantime, it's allowed to make a few queries to the input directly, okay? So that's the general kind of model. But I want to give a running example of maximal independent set um, because I want to, first of all, show you why a, it's, it, you know, why at first, like, making a definition is a little bit a sensitive, okay? So, so maximal independent set, we know this problem. I'm going to assume we know this problem unless somebody unmutes and asks me what it is. But what I want to stress about this is I'm assuming that the graph is degree bounded. And I just want to point out that it's maximal, not maximum independent set. So we're not talking about an NP complete problem right now, okay? So um, simple greedy solves this problem. Okay, so we got the input, and now we want to make queries to the output. So I want to know, is this node U in the maximal independent set? Okay, well, here's a fast but not space efficient local computation algorithm. Uh, what it does is, I'm going to call this lazy greedy, okay? So initially you start out. Need, sorry, can I interrupt yeah. with a question? So because you said the maximal uh, independent set, this is not unique, right? It is not unique. So the, Good the, question. The, okay. Does the local algorithm have to be, you know, so there's some consistency? It has to sort of pick one? Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's what, that's exactly what the point I want to make. So okay. great. Great question. Let's make that point. Um, in all of the, in a lot of the other problems, uh, in the, for example, in um, in the decoding problems, and in, in a lot of cases, there was a unique way of sort of coming up with an answer. But for example, in list decoding, you had to pick one, right? And you have to answer according, you know. So, but anyone is okay. You just need to be consistent. Here, maximal independent set, it's a little bit even more complicated because you um you need to. Every node is in some maximal independent set, okay? So what's preventing you from just saying yes to every single node? Right. What you yeah. need to have is, uh, I mean, and this is the difficulty of defining what you want from, I mean, it's not a difficult thing to do, but I'm just saying that this is the thing you need to think about when you define what you want from a local computation algorithm. For example, you want to make sure that if I ask more than one query that I am consistent with a single answer, okay? So that's... Uh, so thank you for that question. So um, so how could we do that? Uh, so there's lots of maximal independent sets. Everybody's in a maximal in, in some maximal independent set, but I got to answer consistently with a single maximal independent set. Okay. It may, in fact, maybe I'm consistent with many maximal independent sets, but I've got to be consistent with at least one maximal independent set in my answers. Okay. So I'm going to call this the lazy greedy algorithm. Initially, you start with the maximal independent set that's empty. And I'm going to let the queries um, define which maximal independent set we output according to. OK, so when a query comes in and said, is node u in the maximal independent set, then if none of the neighbors of u have been placed in the maximal independent set yet, then I'm just going to put u into the maximal independent set. OK, so now you can see here that the, the maximal independent set we output is dependent on the query order, and I need to remember all previous queries. So I don't need a lot of time to process a query. I only need order D time, because we're assuming bounded degree. I only need order D, the degree time, to decide whether to, or not to put you into the maximal independent set. But I do need to keep track of the history, which could be order N space. Okay, so this is some problems with this definite, with this, I mean, this is a perfectly fine local computation algorithm, but it has heavy duty requirements on space. The answer depends on the query order. You've got to remember all the past choices. And if you had two different local computation algorithms running around in parallel, but not talking to each other, uh, then you wouldn't be able to use this algorithm because they might make decisions that are contrary to each other. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But can we avoid these problems? And that's the question. But the big challenge we're going to have here is consistency. Okay, so let me say a little bit more about the model now. Um, it's a, let's say we have F, it's some computation problem. The input is X. Uh, let's say it's got, it's an N bit, it's an input of size N. 
Um, and let's call f of x, capital F of x, the set of legal, legal solutions. Let's say we have s legal solutions, y1 through ys. What the LCA needs to do is implement Oracle access to, to one of these yk's. Okay, so for any sequence of queries, it's going to reply according to one of these k's, yk's. And we should, we're going to parameterize the, um, the time per query. T of n is the time the LCA spends per query. S of n is the total space of the LCA. And we ask that it be correct for all queries with probability at least 1 minus delta. So in particular, I, when I talk about the failure probability, I don't mean per query. I mean over the whole run. Okay, so it makes it a little bit more difficult, but uh, you have to keep it in this way. Okay, so we want t of n to be sublinear. Um, we actually want s of n to be sublinear too, but a, a, but for right now we at least want t of n to be sublinear. Now, and I should say the lazy greedy is fine for MIS for maximal independent set. It's not necessarily that the, you know, that, that it's not the case that all. Um, that all local computation algorithms can just use greedy and be done with it, and that you know this issue of space is the only thing I'm talking about for the rest of the hour. Uh, it's just in that particular example of MIS, there is an easy, uh, there there is an easy local computation algorithm, but we're going to do better. Okay, uh, better in terms of space. All right. So, uh, in, question: in question Is the algorithm provided with the number of queries I'm going to make or not for that d of delta of n? I. It is not provided. Okay. It is no. Okay. So, so here's just a picture. Here's our input x. Our LCA has, you know, it can be a randomized algorithm. It could use the random string to pick which uh, which solution we're going to output according to, and it, then it has some additional workspace. Uh, and y1 through yS were the possible outputs. It has to pick one. So, you know, it tosses the coin, the random string, it picks yk, and now from now on, every time I ask a question, I ask about i1, it tells me about i1 in y sub k, I ask about i2, it, it picks, it tells me what's yk in location i2, and it sticks consistently to the same, um, to the same yk solution. Okay, so that's, that's the picture that I just defined. Okay, so the question is, can we achieve fast local computation algorithms, space efficient, history independent, and can we allow simultaneous local computation algorithms? And if we can do that, then we could hope to use it in a sort of setting of cloud computation where you can coordinate without too much communication. So maybe uh, the LCAs would agree on some random string before they go off and compute on their own, and then they don't have to talk to each other anymore after that. So this is not... This is not distributed computation in the sense that there is a discussion in the beginning about what random string we're going to agree on, but after that, there's no discussion about what queries did you get, what queries did I get. Okay, that would be that would be a goal. Okay, all right. So that's the picture of swarms of LCAs initially share a random string and afterwards compute independently. All right, good. Okay. So how could we design, design good LCAs? And there's actually been quite a bit of work on this, even in the last year. Uh, and, uh, and so kind of the hope is you're trying to find some kind of normal maximal independent set algorithm um, for which the output for any particular node V depends only on a few other inputs. And if you could do such a thing, then you could simulate this algorithm A's behavior for V. So A is not necessarily an LCA. It could just be a regular sequential algorithm or some other kind, you know, later we'll use parallel distributed algorithms. But we're going to simulate what they do and figure out what it would have said for node V. Okay, so that's the goal. So in fact, I kind of gave you a hint about idea number one is going to be let's look at what's going on in distributed algorithms because they're really going to help us. Okay, so here's an idea. Um, Here's a notion that's been a very powerful tool uh, due to Parnas Run that they noted that if there's a k-round distributed algorithm for MIS or actually any problem, um, so okay. So one thing I should say about distributed algorithms that might not be immediately clear if you're not used to dealing with distributed algorithms is what's the input and what is the uh, the the connection network of the um, distributed algorithm, it's the same, okay? So dip, distributed algorithms are basically interconnection networks that 
where their input is themselves. Okay, so it's not like there's two different graphs, just um, in case that wasn't clear to you, because sometimes that's not clear to people. Okay, so there's some big graph, um, and we're trying to compute something about this big graph, but this big graph that's the input is also the same uh, big graph that describes the interconnections, um, like who gets to talk to who. Okay? Uh, now, if there's a K-round distributed algorithm for maximal independent set, then that means that any node's output depends only on the inputs and computations of the K-radius ball around that node. Okay, so you can simulate, you can just read off the inputs of this k radius ball and simulate what they would have done in a distributed computation. And you only need d to the k queries. Okay, so I'm talking about query complexity right now, not computation time, but um, because computation time depends on the specific algorithm. Okay, but this is all you need to do. So if you had a really fast distributed algorithm, you'd only need exponential in fast many queries, and maybe that's not so bad. Okay, so but the question is how big is k? How big is the number of rounds we need to solve this problem? Okay. Now the, why is this so exciting? Well, there's been a lot of recent work, maybe the, in the last 10, 15 years, in local distributed algorithms. And in, in, um, in their notion of local is a little bit different than our notion of local, because they're talking about a distributed computation, and we're talking about a sequential computation. Uh, but for them, it means constant number of rounds. So in their case, k is constant. So d to the k is actually all right. You know, and um, the good news for us is they've made huge progress on many combinatorial optimization problems, and they, we can use this to try to get local algorithms, local computation algorithms. Okay, so let's look specifically at the maximal independent set problem because this is our running example. Um, what, how fast can it be computed in a distributed setting? Well, the first bad news, I always start with the bad news, is that lexicographically first MIS is p-complete, meaning it's unlikely to be parallelizable. So that's kind of bad news, but we all know, I mean, well, if we didn't know, we, do, we know now, there's a randomized algorithm that runs in order d log n rounds um, due to Luby. Okay, so it's actually, uh, actually the d, I'm going to, I wrote it as d here, but um. Uh, okay, so this yields, this, if you use it as is, what I wrote here on the slide, is that this would give us um, a horrible LCA because it's 2 to the d log d log n. Uh, so that's like worse than just running a linear time uh, maximal independent set algorithm. But we're going to do a lot better, um, and I should say that um, with additional ideas and different parallel algorithms, or different distributed parallel algorithms, you can do an awful lot better. Uh, and there's been a lot of work, and I would say that actually in this list of papers, um, this last half are all from the past year, uh, pretty much pa past year and a half. Okay, so um, so there's been a lot of recent work here, and. One of the interesting things that happened is that ideas from developing local computation algorithms has also been used um, to improve, to get improved distributed algorithms as well. So there's been interplay between the two fields. Okay, so idea number two is let's, um, this really, I should call this idea number one prime. It's actually, let's use distributed algorithms as a tool instead of like just use them directly a la Parnas run. We're still going to use the idea for idea number one, but we're going to use it in conjunction with other ideas. And in particular, one way we can use it is to break up the graph. Okay, so here's an example for maximal independent set. Um, what we're going to do is take this Luby's algorithm and not run it until the end. We're just going to run it part way. So let me just say, I, I didn't have a, I should, probably should have had a picture, but I don't. What does Luby's algorithm do? Every node decides if it's an, in, okay, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to decide if I'm in, a, in the independent set by tossing a coin with probability one over twice my degree, okay? So I mark myself as possibly I'm putting myself in the independent set with probability one over 2d, and then I look at my neighbors, and if any one of them marked themselves, then I unmark myself and I don't do anything. Okay? But if none of them marked themselves, if all of them, their coins came up tails, then I say, okay, I'm in the independent set, I'm putting myself in the independent set, and I'm taking all my neighbors out with me. Okay? So uh, that's what we do in one round. All right? Now, if we do this, 
now we're just going to do this d times. Like we're going to do d rounds like this. Okay. Now, after we do this, actually, I don't know if you see. Okay. Um, I, I should mention this is an idea that was used in a different context of sublinear algorithms by Marco and Ron um, to get sublinear approximations of certain parameters in the graphs. But once you do this order d times, now we w what we want to argue is that, well, it's pretty clear by a simple probabilistic analysis that not too many nodes are going to be left. You know, like a small fraction of the nodes are going to be remaining in the graph that haven't been either removed because their neighbor was put in the independent set or removed because they were put in the independent set. But, okay, so let's say that everybody that was removed, we call them dead. Whoever remains is still alive. You know, they still could be in the independent set or they could be removed because of their neighbor. But um, now what I want to argue is not only are the live nodes a small fraction of the graph, which is pretty easy to see, but they are also in small connected components. Okay, and this you can do via a Beck-like analysis, the same type of analysis that Beck used uh, to, to prove the algorithmic, his algorithmic version of the Lovas local lemma. Okay, and this is um, how you can do that. And so now what does the local computation algorithm do? He's first going to simulate V's view of the distributed algorithm, the order D rounds of Luby's, um, Luby's kind of a algorithm. And uh, then he, okay, then what remains after that is a small live connected component. So all he has to do now is figure out who's, I mean, okay, so either he was determined by Luby's algorithm or he's still alive. And if he's alive, then he just has to figure out who around him is alive, who's in his connected component. And he, and then it's small. Small means like logarithmic size. And because it's small, um, I can figure out a maximal independent set in this connected component by brute force. Okay, I can just look at everybody and just do linear time in the size of this connected component. It's going to be logarithmic size, and so I'll be done. Okay, so that's the idea. So the idea is basically use the distributed algorithm to get the problem size down and then use some brute force. Okay, and similar ideas were used um, by Baron Boy, Melkin, Petty, and Schneider, and very recently a paper in Soda by Mosin Ghaffari um, where he both improves basically improves that. Everything up from the point of LCAs, I'll, t I'll mention his work again in a few slides. Okay? So, now, Ronit, sorry, sorry, can yeah. I just, start, just, just to make sure, um, so, so here every time you have a query, you run this computation that you described and you figure out if you're in the set or not, you answer, and then you can erase your whole memory. You're not, you're keeping the random string, but that's the one thing, right? Or in between uh, different queries, the LCA. So, who gets oh, 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 I see. So, what you, okay, so what's the, one thing, okay, so yes, you can erase the whole memory, but the, what we're going to do um, to make this really work is you need to remember everybody, you need to know your neighbor's random strings as well. Because in order to stay consistent, everybody needs to sure. know everybody's yeah. random strings. So right. what we're going right. to do really is it turns out you only need login wise independent random strings, and so you're going to generate a small seed. Okay. okay, and everybody's going to agree on this seed, and then once everybody agrees on this seed, so it's like even if you had independent mm -hmm. copies, as long as everybody works with the same seed, we'll all be consistent. Okay, so Thanks. I'm kind of oversimplifying a little bit, but it, that's essentially what you do. Um, okay? All right. Put another question. Oh, good question. Is there right. a trade-off between the number of rounds and the size of the connected components here, or is it some kind of threshold? Can I run, like, for twice as many rounds and get, like, I don't know, something much smaller as connected component, or...? Or does that decay? Okay, that's a good question because uh, so another thing you could do. Um, so for example, what Beck does is he even does two rounds and then he gets it. Uh, he does two rounds of it. He like breaks up the connected components again. Uh, so that's a good question. I haven't thought about that, but I would guess that you could break it down further. Uh, but I'd, I have to think about that offline because it's been a while since I've thought about this. Um, there's a prop. Okay. So one of the issues you need, though, is um, one of the difficulties with local computation algorithms is you always have to make sure uh, that, okay, so what Beck did was he said, okay, first we're going to run a certain number. I mean, we're going to we're gonna make people live and die. And then once they, he didn't use 
Luby's algorithm, he used a different method, um, and people would get determined or not determined, and he would redo, and, and then at the end he had small connected components, but if things didn't work, then he started from scratch. And we don't want to have to figure out if things didn't work, because that's too much computation. Uh, so there, it's not always the case that you can take every algorithmic version of Lovas local lemma and then switch it to a local computation algorithm. Okay, so that I, let's just say, um, in this case, you can, though. Does that answer your question at all? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so idea number three that I wanted to mention, and this is not supposed to be exhaustive, it's just three ideas I wanted to mention, is what happened... Um, is that instead of just simulating a parallel distributed algorithms, maybe we could simulate a sequential algorithm that works like greedy. Okay, so we've already seen that uh, there's a greedy algorithm for a maximal independent set. Um, and here we're going to use an idea of Nguyen and Onak, which um, almost works in this setting, and you just need um, to deal with a few details to get it to actually work for local computations. So. Uh, Okay, so here's an idea of Nguyen and Onak that um, if maybe what you'd want to do is figure out what the greedy algorithm would do. So what does the greedy algorithm do? Okay, so think about sequential greedy. It runs through the nodes in some order. Okay, it can be any order. And previously when we talked about lazy greedy, we picked the order of the queries. So we're not going to pick that order right now. Okay, now pick some fixed arbitrary order that does not depend on the queries. Okay, and once you go through that order, what Greedy does is puts node v, v in the MIS if none of the neighbors that were previous in the order were put in the MIS yet. Okay, so now the LCA needs to compute what would Greedy do on you. So how does it figure that out? It has to look at its neighbors. And it has to figure out what Greedy did on any neighbor that had was lower in the ordering. Okay, so if all my neighbors came after me in the ordering, ordering, I just put myself right into the uh, into the um, MIS. Okay, there's some fixed ordering. Let's say everybody picks a, you know, let's say everybody has an identity. Okay, and that determines the ordering. So if I'm connected only to nodes that come after me. That whose identities are bigger than mine, and so they come after me in the ordering, then I can just put myself right into the MIS. Okay, but maybe one of my neighbors has an identity that's smaller than mine, so it came before me in the ordering. So what do I do? I have to figure out what Greedy would have done on, on my neighbor, because if my neighbor was put into the MIS, I can't go in the MIS. But if my neighbor was, put in the, was not put in the MIS, then I need to go in the MIS. So I need to figure out what happened to all my neighbors that have lower ordering numbers. Okay, so, well, this could be a problem. The dependency chains could be really long. Just think about the line where, you know, the ordering is, is you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to, to a million. Okay, I, I might have to go all the way back to the beginning to figure out what happened there. Okay, so these dependency chains could be long, but what Nguyen and Onak showed is it's usually not if the order is random. So if you give nodes random if you pick a random or order over the nodes, then most of these dependency chains are quite short. Okay, so that's actually very nice. Except, um, what do you need to worry about? Well, if you were trying to just find a large independent set, like an almost maximal independent set, then this would actually be enough because most guys have short dependency chains and I could just solve for most. Unfortunately, we want to get a maximal independent set, so we need to find, you know, a, you know, we, it does need to be maximal. So we need to do a little bit more here, um, and so here we use Galton-Watson branching pro processes, and again, uh, we, um, as I mentioned before, you need to worry about the random bits, so you need to notice that you're only using KY's independent random bits, um, and so every, so you can store random bits in much less space. Okay, so this is yet one other idea that's been used. Um, there have been a number of really cool ideas from distributed algorithms that have been taken over here. There have also been ideas of 
taking distributed algorithms and showing that you can do better than the d to the number of rounds bound. Um, uh, and so, like the work of Evan, Medina, and Ron has shown that you can do much better than just taking the distributed algorithm and and using the normal transformation of um, the degree raised to the number of rounds. Uh, um, and so, let's talk about how well you can do. I'm not going to mention all of the ideas, but there's some really cool algorithms here. Um, as far as dependence on n, there were a bunch of ways of doing maximal independent set. Uh, all of them were either logarithmic in n or polylogarithmic in n, such as log squared, log cubed. Um, but recently, Evan, Medina, and Ron showed you can actually get log star dependence on n uh, in the local computation algorithms. OK, so now what do you, but all of these had terrible uh, dependence on d. So what if you care about your dependence on the degree d? All of these were exponential in d. Um, but recently, we've shown that you can uh, get quasi-poly in D, um, and that was also improved just recently by Mosin Kafari to 2 to the log squared D. Um, and now, but in these examples, in these two examples, the dependence on N is log cubed. Okay, so, uh, so these are the sorts of ideas, and here's a big open question. Well, I don't know, if it's, I think it's a big open question. Uh, and I, I'm very interested in this, is it possible to get polynomial in D dependence? And in particular, can you get poly in D dependence and still get log star in N dependence? So that would be really cool. OK? All right. I want to mention this, is, this was a single problem that I kind of followed in detail here. But there are lots of other problems that LCAs have been applied to. And one interest, um, so when you do maximal independent set, one nice thing about that is you can get um, uh, a maximal matching, and what's nice about maximal matching is you can use that to get approximate maximum matchings. Okay, so there's been a, some nice work done on approximate maximum matchings, uh, and in fact, you for that you can actually get algorithms that are polynomial in the degree. Okay, other uh, problems that have been studied, and uh, the next three were based on low, using kind of Algorithmic versions of Lovas local lemma, uh, radio network broadcast scheduling, hypergraph coloring, KCNF. These are all problems where one takes the uh, parallel algorithm for the algorithmic lo Lovas local lemma and turns it into an LCA. Um, there's you know a lot of open questions here. Can you get the parameters? Can you get the best LLL parameters? Because we did not use the best LLL sequential algorithms. We used a certain um, there. Um, and we actually don't know how to do it. So, uh, so th I think that's a really interesting open question. Um, some other really cool work is recently uh, Hasidim Mansur and Vardy showed that you can you can um, design local computation algorithms for use in mechanism design, and also in online. And Mansur Rubinstein, Vardy, and she showed that you can use them in online algorithms. Um, and let me give an example. For example, if you want to do load balancing of balls and bins, then and a ball wants to figure out which bin it's supposed to be thrown into without figuring out where other, all the other balls are going, uh, then you can um, actually do this in in a local manner. Okay. So what's interesting about that is like you know, it's you know if everybody's just thrown randomly, maybe this is kind of obvious. But when you think about it, that there's the rebalancing and like you send yourself into a a bin that um, has the smallest number of balls in it, um, you may actually need to know what happened to the, all the balls before you. So this this is a, a non-trivial result. Okay, so that's just some other things. Uh, where is my uh, okay? Ah, okay, and what's that? Sorry, compare like in the previous slide there was a log star n. Is there any lower bound in that model, or is it obvious that you need a dependence on n, or is there a hope to completely get rid of that log star n? That's a really good question, and I don't know. Uh, I think, actually, I don't know, but it might be known. I, I uh, uh, so I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to check on that for you. Um, but a, I would look at the paper by Evan, Medina, and Ron because I think that they may have somehow the idea of lower bound sounds familiar to me somewhere. Uh, so. Yeah. There may be, it may be known. Is somebody saying something? Okay. So, 
Thanks. All right, but uh, in all these cases, we have pretty much polylog query and a uh, whoops and space complexity. Um, okay, so now I want to talk um, for the remaining time. Pretty much, I'd like to mention um, another set of problems that have a lot of open questions, uh, kind of in the hopes that somebody might solve it. Okay, so suppose. Um, in, in this section, I want to talk about sparse connected subgraphs. So you're given some, okay, so here's where we started. Let me just give historically how we got to this problem. We know we have a sublinear time algorithms to estimate the size of a minimum spanning tree. Okay, so, but the problem with those sublinear algorithms, I mean, they work in certain conditions, like if, you know, if you have a bound on the ratio from the max to min value of an edge, um, but we can't figure out whether a single edge is supposed to be in the min spanning tree or not. I mean, every time I would talk about this result, then people would ask, but how do you know if a specific edge is supposed to be in the minimum spanning tree? So this is exactly, you know, asking for a local computation algorithm, and we didn't know how to do it. The it didn't fall out of the algorithm, okay? So the hope would be, can we define an LCA for um, minimum spanning trees, or, okay, let's give up on minimum, but maybe small weight spanning trees, or something like that, okay? So given an edge UV, is it in the MST, or in at least something that's close to one of the smallest spanning trees? Okay, so there's a lot of reasons to think that we should be optimistic here. Um, we can approximate the weight of an MST in order one of epsilon squared time um, when the weights are, con you know, are in the range 1 through W, where W is a constant and the degree is constant. Uh, we also have a local reconstructor for connectivity, so maybe that could help, although maybe not, because this model is a bit different. It allows you to add edges to the graph, and in our map model, we actually want a subgraph. Um, and also, there is an LCA for a maximal weighted forest that runs in, uh, I think, constant times in terms of n um, and uh, exponential in terms of the degree. Okay, so here's what we want. We want this LCA that, given an edge, tells us, is it in, the, in a small weight spanning tree? Okay, and we want, of course, we still want this consistency idea because there might be lots of minimum spanning trees, there might be lots of small weight spanning trees, so there could be many answers. We just, again, need to be consistent with the same tree. But the problem that we ran into early on is that even just the spanning problem is just too hard, okay? Because here's a graph where on the right, on this graph here, um, do you see this when I point on the, do you see the mouse? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, okay, good. Um, so this graph over here, we need to say yes on every edge. Okay, and this graph on the left, we need to find some edge to say no to. But how do, how do we tell the difference between this edge and any of these edges? We, um, we need, I think it's pretty easy to see that this is going to take omega of n samples. Okay? So even just the spanning tree problem is way too hard. So let's look at a simpler problem. Let's just try to sparsify the graph. Let's not try to come up with a minimum spanning tree. Let's just come up with a small weight spanning graph. What we want to maintain is connectivity. Okay, so we're going to allow a few extra edges, um, and we'll get some parameters, del um, delta and epsilon. Delta is a failure probability. Epsilon is a fraction of extra edges that I'm going to allow. And we can query access to a connected graph G. And again, we have max degree D. And what we'd like to do is provide Oracle access to a subgraph G prime. G prime is on the same set of nodes exactly. And E prime is a subset of E. So it's like a, a much smaller set of edges, but it's a subset of the original edges. And what we want is that G prime should be connected. And this subset of edges that we pick shouldn't be too big. It shouldn't be more than 1 plus epsilon times um, n. Um, and we might have some failure probability because we, um, so the whole thing should be with probably at least 1 minus delta. And, uh, okay, and G prime should be determined both by G and whatever internal randomness we have. Okay, so the question is, is this new problem easier? It sounds like it could be, but there's still an omega square root and lower bound. So we don't know actually if it's easier. Um, I mean, we don't know if it's easier. We know it can't be done in constant time. We have, it needs at least square root n lower bound. And why do we have this square root, lower root n, square root n lower bound? 
it's because it's hard to locally distinguish a bridge edge that connects two expanders on n over two nodes from an edge in a random graph on n nodes. So like if I get this edge, I can't tell the difference between whether this edge is just in a big expander of size n or it's bridging between two, ex two um, expanders of size n over 2. And in this case, I have to take it. Okay, so that's essentially the idea. I'm just kind of giving an overview. But um, that's essentially why uh, there is a root n lower bound. Okay, so the good news is for expanders, you can get a nearly n to the 1 half upper bound for, for these LCAs. But you do need to know that the expansion um, of, of a set of any size is at least, of size at least omega n to the 1 half is, it, is omega d. Okay, so kind of on one extreme, we can get LCAs for expanders and the running time is like root n. Okay, on the other extreme, there's these anti-expanders, I'm going to call them. Um, and these algorithms have no dependence on n and they're quasi-polynomial in 1 over epsilon in d. So these, what do I mean by an anti-expander? I mean, they really don't expand. So I mean things like hyperfinite graphs or graphs with excluded minor. And we have a few different algorithms for different kinds. Um, also, there's uh, graphs, growth-bounded graphs. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of different algorithms that work in these cases. And I'll, I'll say a bit more of it about it soon. OK. Actually, uh, when am I, am I supposed to end in two minutes or in 10 minutes? Um, uh, okay. No, no, you have 10 minutes. On uh, okay, okay. Uh, so good. So I'll, uh, say, I'll say something about the center. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about an algorithm for expanders. Um, I'm going to talk about a square root n algorithm. It's okay. So I'm kind of cheating on the square root n. It's O tilde of square root n algorithm for expanding graphs. And what I'm going to define before I define the LCA is I'm first going to define a global partitioning algorithm. Um, and then we're going to show how to simulate it locally. OK, so first I'm going to define something that shouldn't look local to you at all. But then we're going to see that we can simulate it. OK, so a, what this does is it's going to partition the nodes into something like root n connected components. Um, and then we're going to each component, what, what our uh, sparse, sparsification is going to include is a spanning tree over each of these components, which in total is just going to give us at most n edges because it's, you know, these are disjoint components, so we're not going to have a, any overlap. And then it's going to have at most one edge between each pair of components. Uh, and since, so root, n, root of epsilon n quantity squared is just epsilon n, so it's going to be at most epsilon n total edges from this part, and in total that's at most 1 plus epsilon n edges. All right, and in the case of expanding graphs, we'll be able to, de to determine the behavior of the global algorithm via a local simulation, OK? So, so how are we going to do this? In phase one, we're going to find a partition. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a bunch of random centers, square root of epsilon n. And then people are, these centers are going to start claiming nodes for their partition, OK? So, we're going to perform BFS in a round-robin fashion. So center number one takes all the nodes that are distance one from it. Center two takes all the distance nodes that are one from distance one from center two. And three takes all its distance one nodes. OK. Then center number one takes all the distance two nodes. Um, and notice that it, ha it can only, OK, it, notice that it cannot take this yellow one because it's already been claimed by s center three. OK. So Wait, that's distance 3. No, yeah. OK, good. That's distance 2 from center 1. Center 1 cannot take it uh, because it was already claimed by center 3. OK, so it can only take distance the next set of nodes that haven't yet been claimed. All right, and so we continue in this round robin fashion. Everybody takes the next set of nodes that haven't, as long as they haven't been claimed. OK, and this way we've partitioned the graph. In, and each center got its group. OK, now which edges do we pick? Well, for each center, we're just going to take the BFS edges. OK, and that's going to be the edges we put in. But we still have to connect. So this connects the different, um, the different partitions. 
I'm stuck there. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this connects to different partitions, but we need connections between partitions. And so between partitions, what we're going to do, I'm going to move my picture up there. Between partitions, we're going to take an edge on the shortest path if it co connects corresponding connected components. Okay, so so if this okay, so if this is a shortest if this edge between here and here is also a shortest path between these components, then I'm going to take it. Okay. All right. So let me this is just recap. Um now what there may be more than one edge on the shortest path between two components, and so I need to pick the one with the lexicograph. I need to pick a smallest lexicographic ordered edge um, in order to get this to work. So overall, the number of edges is what we claimed before, um, and so that's not the hard part to see. What we what's a little bit more tricky is to see that the thing is connected, um, which I'm going to do in a second. But before I do that. I want to mention that there's a bit of a technical problem that we're, we're going to run into later when we try to simulate this locally. Um, and so the, the problem might be that some partitions could be much bigger than others. Um, and if, like, if my partition is much more than square root n, then I, how am I going to locally simulate the BFS in my, in my group? So um, what I want is that each partition is around square root n. Okay, and they should roughly be the same size. So to do that, and this is why, this is why the algorithm is only going to work for expanders and not other kinds of graphs. Okay, so what's nice about expanders is there's some k such that instead of just saying let's continue this forever until every node has been claimed in the graph, for expanders there's some k such that all almost all nodes are in a ball of radius k of some center, and no partition is going to be too big. I mean, most of the partitions are going to be pretty much the same size. So that's a really nice thing about expanders. And this is really important for our local simulation. OK, so a, the other nice thing is this k, I mean, I'm just claiming there is such a k. Actually, the algorithm can quickly find such a k, too. So it's um, nice. OK, so really, um, I'm going to slightly modify the algorithm we had before. We're just going to do k iterations of this round robin fashion. Everybody's going to go, they're going to do their BFS in a round robin fashion up until we get to distance k. And then anything that hasn't been claimed at that point um, just gets to be his own group. OK, so now how do we select the edges? As before, each center takes the BFS edges. And as before, between every pair of centers, we're taking an edge on the shortest path with the smallest lexicographic order if it connects corresponding connected components. Um, but also, if, an ed if a node was unassigned to any center, then we take all the edges adjacent to it. And since there aren't very many nodes that were unassigned to any center, this is not going to be a lot of extra edges. OK, so you can show that so this thing is. Sorry, can I ask? So do you have an example of a graph where this or something similar will not work? Um, I mean, I understand the intuition. I understand why it works for expander and why this exact same thing won't work in general. But it feels like um, you know, if you were to choose the centers at random, and uh, is, is, is it's a real issue, or it's just that you you know, haven't proven that okay. it would so, work? For you? So OK, so is it a real issue? It's a good question. I feel like it, I, I mean, it's a real issue in the proof uh, of the local simulation. So I think, right. the, I think the, the way to, that, I, um, that I think about it is somehow a, if, OK, so if some node somehow gets weight, you know, we do this BFS thing, and some node gets way too many nodes assigned to it uh, before another center, like, you know, you could have one center getting all the nodes uh, when it does BFS. Is that a real issue? Um, maybe somebody can show that it's not a real issue. Actually, I mean, it's a good question. I, so I you, kind of go back and forth. OK. So you do? Maybe. OK. OK, thanks. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, OK. So just, uh, OK, it turns out you can show this thing is connected, um, even though you don't take these edges on the shortest path. Um, if unless they connect the corresponding connected components, um, so if so, basically, if if there's an edge between red and green, the red and green uh, 
you know, the reds and the greens, I don't take this unless it's the lexicographically first shortest path edge between between these guys. So if this like was a longer path, then it, so here you see that these centers can be connected by a path of length three. Um, so I don't want to take this edge. Okay. So to show that it's okay not to take this edge and the thing stays connected, um, I just need to show by induction. Um, and let's just say I'm going to skip that because I'm running out of time anyway. Um, but by induction on the rank and the distance, you can show that this thing will actually be connected. All right, so let me say something about the local simulation. What do you need to do? You need to approximate this value k. And then um, if I want to figure out if u and v are connected, um, I need to find their centers. Okay, so that, for that, um, I need to find their centers. And a, if, and I'm going to hope that their centers, like that their balls are pretty close in size. Now, if either has no centers, then I know that they're one of those leftover nodes where I took all the edges adjacent to them, so I can just return yes. Um, if they're in the same, if they have the same center, they're in the same partition, then I can return yes if edge UV is in the BFS tree, and if they're if they belong to different partitions, then I return yes if UV is part of the shortest path between the center of U and the center of V. Okay, and this query complexity, all I have to do is look find the center, and then look at the whole um, partition assigned to that center, which is hopefully just square root n nodes. Okay, so this is just going to be square root n total query complexity, because I don't have to look at, I just need to look at these two centers. Okay, I mean, I need to look at these two partitions, each one is root n, and then I can make all these decisions. Okay, all right. Um, I'll just mention that for kind of the opposite types of graphs, I'll call them anti-expanding graphs, um, and there's a few such classes, you can get constant time algorithms. So for hyperfinite graphs, these are graphs where if you, there's a way to remove epsilon fraction of the edges and break the graph into really tiny pieces. So you can remove epsilon fraction of the edges and break the graph into constant sized pieces. That's what it means to be hyperfinite. Um, and there, using uh, something called a partition oracle and a Kruskal based algorithm, you can get an algorithm that's quasi poly in 1 over epsilon and d. Um, if you have something further, you know that there's an excluded minor in your gra class of graphs. Um, so these, glass these, these are a special case of hyperfinite graphs, but they're stronger. So here we can even handle the weighted case um, and talk about a sparse low weight spanning graphs. Um, and we can get quasi poly in 1 over epsilon d and the weights. Okay, and uh, maybe I'll, um, I'll just say a tiny bit. There's sort of an interesting thing for slow growth rate graphs, uh, which is they have expansion 1 over log t um, and just a little bit worse than 1 over log t. So it's really slow. It's like it's a little bit worse than 1 over log t expansion. In that case, you can simulate Kruskal's algorithm locally. You're not going to have any small cycles, and then you can just use properties of hyperfinite graphs, and you can get a constant time algorithm. But if the growth rate is only a little bit more, so it's, a, it's slightly bigger than 1 over log t, then you're going to need super constant time to um, to get, design in a local computation algorithm. So it seems like this expansion, the amount of expansion seems um, quite important, um, at least in terms of what's doable in constant time versus non-constant time. Okay, so I think there's a really interesting question here. Is there a sublinear query algorithm for finding sparse spanning subgraphs of any constant degree graph? Um, and I think it should be doable. Um, and I think there should be more known about the weighted case, uh, minimum spanning graphs, um, and maybe also to look at the case of MST for points in a metric space. Uh, you can see the sublinear approximation of Chumai and Solar, uh, and uh, maybe that's a good starting point. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about local correction of distribution. So I just want to say that we've talked about local corrections of codes, compressions, uh, graphs, um, and all kinds of, you know, I even mentioned KCNF. Um, what about distributions? I'm just going to say that um, there wasn't a, um, 
there is a work that's trying to apply local correction also to samples of distributions. Um, so sort of you want to, the idea there is you're given samples of a distribution that's assumed to be epsilon close to some class P. P might be the class of say k-modal distributions or distributions that can be described by um, a histogram with k, um, k pieces. Um, and what you'd like to output is sort of a fixed version of Q. So you'd like to output some Q prime that is both close to the original Q but also has this property of um, the class P. Okay, so the main, um, so what you're interested in here is how many, um, how many samples do you need in order to out of Q in order to output samples of Q prime? Um, and there's lots of open questions here. In particular, I think the main question is when is correction easier than like a complete agnostic learning of the distribution? Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, so we've developed this model of LCAs. Um, it's supposed to distill many common features. It's also supposed to apply to a more uh, general computation problems, um, functions, graphs, strings, distributions. Uh, the memory access is, allows uh, random access. It doesn't limit um, anything as, as is done in sort of distributed memory or some definitions of local algorithms that I've seen allow you only to look at a radius k ball around the node. Um, the space-time requirements are parameterized. For example, in local distributed algorithms, they ask for constant rounds. In some, in many cases, people uh, don't consider the running time or uh, compared to other parameters of the graphs. Um, so here, basically, what we're really interested in is any kind of sublinear time. Um, how does this model compare to other models? Well, some of the other models forced you to have local probes. For example, in the in the local distributed computation models, which is I, it's distributed, not sequential computation, but it, they force you to have local probes in the sense that you had to, you could only ask about neighbors and neighbors of neighbors and neighbors of neighbors of neighbors. Um, the question is, is the fact that we allowed um, random access anywhere in the graph helpful? Well, it seems that for some large class of what I'm going to call what well what they call nice graph problems. Uh, these non-local probes do not help, um, but it's it may be the case that it does help in some other types of graphs. Okay, so a, I also want to mention that this notion of uh, local com like local algorithms that only allows you to look at k radius um, probes is may not be the right measure because we've seen already today a couple of examples such as the Nguyen Onak result and also the result of um, uh, that I, I, we didn't see it but I'm going to tell you that the result of Evan Medina and Ron um, they they do better than looking at the full K radius so so let's say you have the same number of probes but in on this side I require you to only look at things in the D to the you know the D to the K locations in the K radius, but here I allow you to use any D to the K probes, but um in any shape that you want. Maybe there are better areas to go down than just you know sticking within radius K. And it turns out that it seems this can often help. That this side is often better, um, or at least seems to be helpful. Okay, so another takeaway message I want to mention is that um by dealing um. It seems like we've killed several birds with one stone. Um, you know, I don't have a theorem to show this, but, but somehow by limiting the space and asking that, um, somehow asking for limited space or asking for um, two separate versions of a local computation algorithm to come up with consistent answers or to ask that the local computation algorithm be history independent, it seems like, you know, once you solve one of these, it, you solved all three, so um, these seem to be related. Some of these, I mean, simultaneous consistency and history independence seem obvious they should be related, but also, but interestingly also the space is related. Okay, so there is a lot of open questions. Uh, better techniques, other techniques, uh, usually the dependency on D is quasi-polynomial or exponential. Can you get polynomial? Um, can you do things with arbitrary degrees? Can you even... Uh, what about um, some of the problems that are open are problems that we looked at where we um, we kind of simulated the, lo the algorithmic versions of the Lovell's local lemma. Uh, can you get, but we couldn't use the, the best Lovell's local lemma 
algorithmic versions of Moser Tardish, can you get these best uh, parameters on, for hypergraph coloring? What about other problems such as resource management? Um, what about finding local computations for minimum spanners? Uh, string matching? How about dynamic local computation algorithms when the input is changing? Um, so I think there's really a number of questions and um, I think I'm going to just leave it there. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Ronit, for giving this talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? All right. Uh, there don't seem to be any questions right now. Um, and let me ask just one question. Oh, Maybe okay. it's a bit of a vague question. So it's, it was exhaustive, I think. The survey um, was exhausting. <laughs> well, so actually I was wondering if, um, because you started by motivating this using uh, locally decodable codes and um, and uh, and com the com compression, decompression, um, and then you discussed things that had a slightly different flavor, right? So um, these graph problems. So is it is it um, uh, can you reconcile the two? I mean, is is there a connection between the two? Or so LDCs and these um, uh, local decompression algorithms. The, from what I know, they have a very different flavor from what you described. Um, so is, is there an interaction between the two kinds of problems, or are you just saying, well, the model captures different things? And so, so basically, I think this model captures algebraic problems, it captures combinatorial problems, it captures function problems, string problems. Uh, but so, the, okay, the kind of ideas that you described, they're, okay, I guess I haven't seen them But what I focused yet. on in the talk today were really graph problems, that's true. Like I did not talk about techniques for, uh, for the codes, but I don't see it. Um, I don't see it as a different model. I see it more as different problems within the same model. So an another question, by the way, when when you started, you insisted that the um, algorithm should be correct with a certain probability for all the queries, right? And you said, oh, that's how I'm going to measure uh, correctness. Right. Um, does it make sense to relax this so where you know you'd ask that the queries uh, that have been made so far the answers that you've given um, are 90% consistent with you know some maximal independent set or whatever uh, you're actually trying to compute but some of, so something closer to property testing in, in, in the model so that actually makes sense uh, it's a uh, it does make sense um, and sometimes those problems, okay, so some, it's, it's a little bit similar to the problem of an approximate maximal matching. Uh, so an approximate maximal matching right. isn't maximal, uh, but it's, it's close in size to some maximal matching. Uh, so the problems would make sense. Um, the reason I defined it this way is for the problems we were interested in we really needed it all to be, I mean, basically I'm saying it's, it would be a different problem. And then, and then it would, you know, you could define a problem where you only need to be close in the property testing way. And then it would be easier to get that one minus delta correctness. Yeah. So, the, the, so basically, uh, we're allow you know once you define the problem and what you need, then you need the one minus delta correctness. If all you need is that you're ninety percent close, then it's going to be easier to get that one minus delta correctness. Uh, but but the model can in the model you can describe each of these problems. So I've got two. <clears throat> Sorry, two other questions. The first one, I'm not sure it's completely well defined. Is there a notion of chaining uh, such algorithms, composing them, them together? For example, if I've got one that uh, gives me access to some trimmed down version of a graph, can I plug it another one to get, uh, is it possible to get one that's going to be valid if I plug it something to compute either MIS or some other uh, kind of problem, some kind of First step that will work for other uh, others, but still reducing the graph in in the meantime. So, you, okay, you can you can do like okay. So in some sense, that's what what we did there was we used like we used one algorithm to reduce the size of the graphs into small connected components, and then we ran a local computation algorithm on what was left. 
Uh, so in some sense, you have to use the local computation algorithm to go around to all the nodes and figure out like who's left after round one. And then, I mean, kind of, you know, when you actually describe what the local computation algorithm has to do, the description it can get a little hairy because everybody has to figure out what they would have done in round one, and then they have to figure out um, whether they're still alive, and then they have to figure out which of their neighbors are still alive after round one, and then from that I have to figure out who's around, like, then you do something else for round two and it could be something totally different, so I have to figure out if, um, what happened to me after round two. So you could, you could chain these things, but you have to be careful because if it, if it's like an algorithm that requires you to, like, back up and try again if you blew it, then, um, then things can get kind of difficult. Because how do you know whether you blew it? Like, and how do you know if you were supposed to back up? And this was actually part of the problem with the Moser Tardish. When we were trying to figure out how to get an LCA based on Moser Tardish, is we never knew when we were done. Because we didn't know maybe, you know, we didn't know if our neighbors were done, so we didn't know if we have the right answer from them, so we never knew if we were done. So th that's why it's a bit, um, it can get a bit tricky. Uh, but you can you can compose if you know when you're done, basically. Okay. Uh, and the second one is, uh, I don't know how that would be formulated, but is there a notion of a differentially private uh, LCA in that case? Not so that I know of, but it sounds cool. Hi. Uh, Great. Are there any other questions from anyone? All right. I think that seems to be it. So we're going to take this offline, and you can hang out a bit longer with the speaker if you'd like. Um, uh, just as a reminder, two weeks from today, we have another, a talk by Ola Svensson, so stay tuned for more info about that. Besides that, uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Runeet. I'll uh, take us offline. <laughs>